This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. Yeah, what's all this? Keep back there. Keep back me? Do you know who you're talking to? I give you a last chance to leave me alone. Give me a last chance. You've committed assault this when you've done, and you can come along to the station with me. Come along now, come quietly, unless you want me to put the handcuffs on. Stop where you are. You don't know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing, all right. Come on. Get hold of him. Lock him up. All right, you fools. You've brought it on yourselves. Everything would have come right if you'd only left me alone. You've driven me near madness with your peering through the keyholes and gaping through the curtains. And now you'll suffer for it. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. There's a souvenir for you. And one for you. I'll show you who I am and what I am. <laughs> Look. He's all eaten away. Huh? How do you like that, eh? <laughs> Place to be Nation, welcome back to the newest episode of Pop Goes the Classics here on the Place to be Nation Pop Feed. I copyrighted that, by the way. <laughs> I, am, <laughs> I am Scott Criscolo. Um, if you are new to the pop feed, and it's the first show you've clicked, welcome. It's good to have you. we got a great feed here. A lot of fun stuff. If this is not your first time, uh, welcome back. Pop Goes the Classics, of course, is kind of a, uh, it's like a spinoff, kind of like uh, Laverne and Shirley was a spinoff of Happy Days. Pop Goes the Classics is a spinoff of Pop Goes the Movies. Uh, for you that are new, uh, Pop Goes the Movies is a tremendous pod blast here on the Pop Feed where uh, any number of our untapped talent, unbelievable talent here on the Pop Feed, um, reviews uh, a movie that is currently in theaters. And you see a bunch of uh, the Pop Goes the Movies all over the place. I've done a couple myself. And uh, uh, it's very successful. So I said to the boss, uh, PlaceToBeNation.com, our good friend, Mr. Andy Atherton, I said, why don't we expand Pop Goes the Movies to not just uh, reviews of current films, but come on, we got to touch some of the greatest films of the past. And of course he said yes. So thus, we have Pop Goes the Classics. And I, uh, I said to him, I said, well, I got a good way to get started. Why don't we dive into some of the greatest horror movies of all time, considering it is October and it is Halloween and it's Horror Month. We'll do this again next year, probably. Uh, with some newer horror movies, but I really wanted to dive into, because I'm fascinated with them, uh, the Universal Monsterverse. Um, first off, I bought the Blu-ray set, uh, I would say I would say about two and a half months ago, um, the 30-film uh, Universal Monster Blu-ray collection that came out by Universal, obviously. Um, all 30 films of the official Monsterverse timeline that began in 1931 and went until 1956. Um, but here on Pop Goes the Classics, at least I'm just going to handle the big six. Tonight is the fourth of the big six. Uh, th again, if this is the first time you're listening, thank you. You can keep listening to this one, but please go back to the previous three episodes. Uh, I did Dracula with Bella Lugosi, Frankenstein with Boris Karloff, and The Mummy also with Boris Karloff. Tonight we're going to do the fourth of the big six. And this one is an interesting one to talk about because in the grand scheme of things, is it really a horror movie per se? Is it sci-fi? Is it suspense? I think it's a lot of everything. Tonight we're going to talk about, again, produced by Carl Lemley Jr., directed by James Whale and starring Claude Rains, The Invisible Man, which came out on November 13th, 1933. Um, this came from an H.G. Wells novel called The Invisible Man, which was published in 1897. Claude Rains, in his first American screen appearance, by the way, and of course he would star later on in another in an adaptation of the legendary Phantom of the Opera. That would come out uh, in 19, about a decade later, I think 1943. Um, 
that's not the one that you always see the the silent movie highlight uh, with the, the the scary phantom with no nose and the eyes while he's playing the piano. No, that's that's the silent film one. Uh, this was one that came out in the '40s, starring Claude Rains. And of course, Claude Rains, legendary actor. But this is a big deal because this was his first American appearance. Of course, Doctor Jack Griffin was the character's name. The film has been described as a nearly perfect translation of the spirit of the book. It spawned a number of sequels that are within the MonsterVerse, uh, many spin-offs, um, using the idea of an invisible man or woman, uh, in, in a couple of cases, largely unrelated to Wells' original story. Now, Claw Rains plays the invisible man mostly only as a disembodied voice. He's shown briefly at the end of the film, but most of his on-screen time he is covered in bandages because he's supposed to be invisible. In 2008, by the way, The Invisible Man was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress for being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. And it is. Just to give you a quick background of the, the plot, um, a stranger walks into a uh, um, an inn, the Lion's Head Inn, in the English village of Ipsing, Ipping in Sussex. The man demands that he be left alone. He's... Um, He's he needs a room to do research. He falls behind on the rent. The stranger throws the guy down the stairs when he tries to get uh, the uh, the uh, the rent. Um, who is this stranger? Well, it turns out the stranger is Dr. Jack Griffin, a chemist who has discovered the secret of invisibility while conducting a series of tests uh, involving an obscure drug called monocaine. Uh, Griffin's fiance. Flora Cranley, and the daughter of Griffin's employer, Dr. Cranley, becomes distraught over Griffin's long absence. Cranley and his other assistant, Dr. Kemp, search his empty laboratory, finding only a single note in a cupboard. He be she becomes concerned when uh, he becomes concerned when he reads it. On the note is a list of chemicals, including monocaine, which Cranley knows is extremely dangerous. An injection of it drove a dog mad in Germany. Well, Griffin, it seems, is unaware of this. He cranly deduces that he may have learned about monocane in English books printed before the incident that could only described its bleaching power, which is, in essence, what makes him invisible. He's bleaching. Well, anyway, the story continues. In the end, Griffin seeks shelter after... Well, what happens is the chief detective in charge of the search, uh, of a search uh, for Griffin after some crimes were committed, feeling that Griffin will try to fulfill his promise, devises various traps... Uh, the police disguise Kemp in a police uniform, let him drive his car away. Griffin's hiding in the back of the car. And in the end, Griffin is taken to the hospital where on his deathbed, he admits to Flora, his fiance, that I meddled in things that man must leave alone. As he dies, his body becomes visible again. And again, that is the only time you see the actual actor, Claude Rains, uh, in the film. I didn't want to ruin it first. I want to read the whole plot. But again, Claude Rains uh, was the Invisible Man. Also starred William Harrigan, Henry Travers. And a name that, that some newer, um, uh, newer, uh, maybe younger uh, moviegoers would know. A name by the name of Gloria Stewart. Uh, she played the, the, um, uh, she played the uh, fiancé. For those that don't know who that is, do you remember the movie Titanic? The actress who played Old Rose. Of course, Young Rose was played, was played by Kate Winslet. Well, Old Rose, the one that that, uh, uh, that the uh, scientists talked to in the beginning of the film, that was Gloria Stewart. What a life she lived. She died on, Dece on September 26, 2010, at the age of 100 years old. God bless her. That's awesome. Um, Walter Brennan was in this movie as well, and John Carradine, who was under another, uh, another name. Now, Claude Rains was not the studio's first choice to play the lead role. Guess who was originally supposed to play? Think about it. Who's been in all these other films? Or most of them? You guessed it. Boris Karloff. Um, however, Carl Emily Jr. Uh, decided that he that, that that Karloff obviously was making a ton of money and he had every right to because he was obviously he was the star in both Frankenstein and The Mummy and was exceptional in both. So he wanted a little extra shkadol, uh, scratch. And Carl Emily said, ah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> So he, uh, Boris Karloff, withdrew. To replace Karloff, other names such as Chester Morris, Paul Lucas, and even Colin Clive were considered for the part. It was James Whale, the director of Frankenstein. Uh, he replaced Cyril Gardner, who wanted Claude Rains to play Griffin. Rains was his first choice. 
Problems in developing the script held up the project for some time, and in June of 1932, uh, the film was called off temporarily. Um, however, it was brought back, and it was in production from June to August at Universal Studios. Listen to this. Filming was interrupted near the end by a fire after a smudge pot, whatever the hell that is, sounds like something very vintage, uh, kicked into some hay, which damaged an exterior set. Uh, the film came out, as I mentioned, on November 13th, 1933. and was marketed with the taglines, Catch Me If You Can, which of course was a great movie with uh, Leo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks, and H.G. Wells' Fantastic Sensation. Now, for those that read the book, The Invisible Man, which was published in 1897, and some people have read it, uh, the basic framework of the story and the characters' names are largely the same in the novel. There are some great differences. Each take place around the same time it was released. The novel, of course, was the 1890s, and the film took place when it was taking place in 1933. In the novel, Griffin remains almost totally mysterious. No fiancé, no friends. He was a loner. Of course, in the film, he's engaged to, to, um, to Flora, and he's got friends and coworkers and you know colleagues and such. So he wasn't as much of a hermit or a recluse as he was in H.G. Wells' book. In the novel, Griffin is already insane before he makes himself invisible. In the film, Griffin's sympathetic, motivated by his ambition to make a breakthrough, and the invisibility serum drove him nuts. Let me, ref let, me, let me clarify that for a minute. Because you're probably thinking to yourself, is this even a horror movie? This isn't Dracula. It's not Frankenstein. It's not The Mummy. It's not some scary, scary-looking monster. That's why I said at the beginning of the pod blast that you could classify The Invisible Man as, as horror or sci-fi or suspense. But I think the premise that Dr. Griffin was going crazy because of the serum and because of the uh, his obsession uh, with wanting to this medical breakthrough to be invisible and the serum drove him nuts and that is a premise that lasts throughout the sequels or the I wouldn't really call them sequels because obviously Dr. Griffin as I mentioned died in the end so there really wasn't any extras the spin-offs they are connected because Dr. because the Jack Griffin character is mentioned in future invisible films invisible woman uh invisible agent the return of the invisible man uh which by the way vincent price is in um so the the concept that the invisibility serum drives you nuts uh stays throughout the spin-offs and sequels dr kemp survives in the novel in the film uh he's terrified throughout and prays for his pays for his life for betraying griffin obviously the big thing about this film which is a big deal in 1933, is the special effects. Um, John Fulton, John Meskel, Frank Williams, all should be given great credit because there was a lot of obvious moments in the film where um, objects are lifted up by, you know, piano wire or something like that or, or some kind of, uh, you know, something moves it. Well, when the Invisible Man had no clothes on, the effect was achieved through the use of wires, you know, but... When he had some of his clothes on or was taking his clothes off, the effect was achieved by shooting Claude Rains in a completely black velvet suit against a black velvet background and then combining this shot with another shot of the location the scene took place in using a map process. I mean, this is kind of revolutionary for 1933. Consequently, the work was especially difficult for him and a double who was somewhat shorter than Rains was sometimes used. Now, the effect of Reigns seeming to disappear was created by making a head and body cast of the actor from which a mask was made. The mask was then photographed against a specially prepared background, and the film was treated in the laboratory to complete the effect. <laughs> there is a lapse at the end of the film when the invisible Reigns walks through the snow and the outlined indentations as he walks appear as the imprints of shoes instead of his naked feet. But, you know, in 1933, nobody was that OCD. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think anybody really even noticed or cared. This was Universal's most popular film since Frankenstein. To this point, Frankenstein was the most popular film. Um, it got great reaction. It got great uh, uh, positive re uh, reaction from, from critics. Um, despite the critical acclaim, H.G. Wells, the author of the book, said at a dinner in his honor that, quote, while he liked the picture, he had one great fault to find with it. It had taken his brilliant scientist and changed him into a lunatic, a liberty he could not condone. Whale, Whale replied, James Whale, the director, replied that the film was addressed to the rationally minded motion picture audience because in the minds of rational people, quote, 
Only a lunatic would want to make himself invisible anyway. Uh, in the original novel, by the way, the scientist was amoral from the start and did not hesitate to rob his own father to get the money to buy certain drugs, etc., for the process. In the movie, an essential color-removing drug in the process had the unavoidable side effect of unbalancing his mind. So that's the main difference. In the book, he was always a, a piece of crap. In the movie, he was a moral guy who was looking to attempt to better himself or better society, and in the end, it drove him mad. So it's very similar to Frankenstein in the sense that our hero or the villain is somewhat sympathetic, almost an anti-hero. Not like the mummy and not like Dracula. They're just full-blown villains. But if, if you listen to the uh, to the Frankenstein pod blast, you'll understand more um, the concept of, of the anti-hero this early on in, in cinema. Now, James Whale, who again had, had directed Frankenstein as well as the first version of Waterloo Bridge, uh, received a special recommendation from the 1934 Venice Film Festival in recognition of The Invisible Man. Rain's film career took off after this. Uh, again, it was his first American film appearance. Uh, by the way, the film was nominated for AFI's 100 Years, 100 Thrills, and AFI's 10 Top 10 Science Fiction Films, while the character was nominated as a villain for 100 Years, 100 Heroes, and Villains. As I mentioned, there were sequels, and they were reboots. The immediate sequel, the first one, The Invisible Man Returns, which came out seven years later in 1940, uh, guess who? Vincent Price in one of his first roles as a new Invisible Man, while John Sutton played the brother of Claude Rains' character from this from this film. Then there was Invisible Woman, Invisible Agent, and then, of course, what would a, a, a 1940s universal horror f character be without an Abbott and Costello appearance as well? Invisible Man, Invisible Man Returns, Invisible Woman, Invisible Agent, and The Invisible Man's Revenge. Those are all the sequels. Now, in February of 2016, you're wondering if they ever tried to reboot this. It was announced that Johnny Depp would star in the remake with Ed Solomon writing the script while Alex Kurtzman and Chris Morgan would be the producers. Now, the film was planned as part of the Universal Pictures modern-day reboot of Universal Monsters, which was called Dark Universe. The series of films, which began with The Mummy, which was the one with Tom Cruise, uh, was to be followed by Bride of Frankenstein, which was supposed to come out this year, 2019. Kurtzman stated the fans should expect at least one film per year in the shared film universe. However, on November 8th of 2017, Kurtzman and Morgan moved on to other projects, leaving the future of the dark universe in doubt. In January of this year, Universal announced it was going to scrap the universe and make filmmaker-driven films based on the classic monsters, starting with a remake of The Invisible Man, written and directed by Lee Wannell and produced by Jason Blum. But it would not star Johnny Depp. But Elizabeth Moss was in, ta was in talks to star Cecilia Cass. It is expected to be released on February 28th of next year. So there will be an Invisible Man movie, but it doesn't look like they're going to try to reboot the Universal Monsterverse, which is kind of sad. However, having said that, there really is something for the original Universal Monsterverse. Again, to uh, in case you're interested in getting uh, the Invisible Man or any of these sets, just go to Amazon.com. Just go to Amazon. And look up Universal Monsters uh, under Blu-ray, and they have uh, the eight. They have an, a small eight film collection, which is not expensive. Or if you want to splurge, right now it's not cheap. It's like one hundred and thirty dollars. I got it for a pretty good deal on Prime Day. Uh, you can get the thirty film um, Universal Monster collection uh, on Blu-ray, and it's got all the sequels and it's got the original movie, tons of extras. Uh, it's a great set. I highly recommend it if you have the money. And that is it, a nice quickie of the Universal uh, Monsterverse uh, presentation of The Invisible Man. Here at Pop Goes the Movies. That's how quick some of these are. Now, uh, just to say, this was a quick one. Um, other ones in the future might be longer. Uh, there'll obviously be some that have more than one person. It won't just be me. Um, some of the great people on the Pop feed, like Andy Atherton and uh, J.R. Arsenio D'Amato and, and, and uh, Tim Capel and... Um, the purveyor of the Jenny position, Jennifer Smith, and a whole, a whole bunch of others. Um, they'll always be here. They'll all be here to give uh, their uh, Pop Goes the Classics choices. So this is not just me, and it's not just horror. Um, we, uh, I'm just doing horror because it's October. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, there will be six total of the Universal Monster, um, uh, Monsterverse Big Six. Uh, as I mentioned, I've done Dracula, Frankenstein, the Mummy, and now I've done The Invisible Man. There's two left. We still have to do The Wolfman with Lon Chaney Jr. 
And we also have to do the creature from the Black Lagoon. Remember that one? With the rubber... <laughs> rubber gill man? Uh, one of the first 3D movies I ever saw. In any event, I'm Scott Criscolo. Thank you for joining me here on Pop Goes the Classics. And don't disappear. You may wish you wanted to be invisible, but sometimes, as with Claude Rains or Dr. Jack Griffin, be careful what you wish for. Enjoy. Enjoy.